Hey guys, today we're going to look at how to set up a mesh refinement study in Fluent, also referred to as a mesh independent study or grid independent study, and figure out how this helps us develop a suitable mesh for our CFD application. The first thing we want to discuss when talking about developing a mesh or a mesh refinement study is to first look at some of the errors in a CFD problem. The AIAA 1998 definition or American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics defines both error and uncertainty. Error they define as a recognizable deficiency that is not due to the lack of knowledge, essentially what we have control over when we're setting up our CFD problem. Uncertainty, on the other hand, is a potential deficiency due, that is due to the lack of knowledge. The uncertainty can come from modeling, it can come from numerics and other sources, and it's stuff that we can't control. So it's not due to our lack of knowledge, but a potential deficiency in our setup. Some of the most common errors that come up in a CFT problem are listed here. The discretization error and roundoff error are two errors that we're going to analyze in our mesh refinement study and we'll discuss a little bit more about later. Iteration or convergence error is another important source of error and this essentially comes with when you're running your CFT calculation using an iterative solver. If you do not let the solution iterate long enough and it does not converge, you will get a source of error. This will, we will not be discussing much today. The next one is a physical modeling error. Whenever we're doing CFD, we're making a mathematical model of a physical phenomena, and there's always gonna be some errors in our modeling. So physical modeling error is something you should always be aware of and make sure that you denote it in, in all of your CFD uh, data sets. The final one which we're gonna look at, which is tangentially related to this mesh optimization is gonna be human error. And we'll discuss a little bit more about that in the next slide. So let's look at some of the details of the errors and how they relate to our mesh refinement study. So the first one we're gonna look at is the discretization error. So the discretization error, we can look at an assumed transport variable phi, and we can look at the finite difference formulation and specifically the Taylor series of that finite difference formulation. So in this case, you can see we have delta phi over delta x, and we have our Taylor series expansion. At the end of our Taylor series expansion, you see this error, or o, o delta x. In this case, on the top line, this is due to our spatial derivative, and this really relates to our mesh size. So as we change the mesh size smaller and smaller, our trunc truncation error is gonna go down. If you're doing a transient problem, the time derivative will also become relevant. So in this case, we have uh, d phi dt. Again, taking the Taylor series expansion, you can see this truncation error on the end of that. If you're doing a transient analysis, you can also do a time sensitivity analysis. But in our case, we're just going to be looking at a mesh analysis today. So this time derivative would not be relevant. The next error we want to look at is roundoff error. And roundoff error is something that you're probably familiar with in your everyday life. If you have a decimal number, and if you round up or round down or use any sort of rounding mechanism, you're always gonna get some uh, bit of error. In CFD calculations, you'll see two values usually denoted in the Fluent Launcher and other CFD applications, which are single precision and double precision. What these refer to is the amount of bits or essentially how long of a number the software will hold. Single precision, since it only stores 32 bits for every number, will be a little bit quicker to run, but you may lose a little bit of error and get more round off error since you'll have to truncate your values as you're going through your mathematics. Double precision, on the other hand, doubles that number to 64 and can hold longer strings of numbers and have more floating points and give you a more accurate answer. Usually round off error when we compare it to discretization error or other physical modeling errors is usually a minimal source of error, but something we should always be aware of. And finally, human error. So specifically when we're talking about mesh generation, the two things that we really want to look at with our mesh is if our mesh is cap capturing the ROI or region of interest that we're looking at. So if we're doing external flow or internal flow, we want to make sure the walls are captured correctly. If we have boundary layers where we need boundary layers, if we have a smaller mesh around the region of interest versus you know areas that don't really matter. So this is where kind of the art meshes with the science and mesh generation. The next thing we want to check is, is our mesh quality okay? So we want to check our skewness, our 
uh, orthogonal quality, aspect ratio, do we have any negative cell volumes or any other errors in the mesh. And we want to make sure we reduce those ahead of time. And in the chart here on the right, you can see a good example of the trade-off between discretization error and round-off error versus step size. So what you can see here, this is denoted as step size. You can also interchange this with mesh size. As we decrease our mesh size, our round-off error is going to go up because we're going to be making more and more calculations on that finer and finer mesh, which means our round-off error is going to accumulate more and more. On the other hand, our discretization error, uh, like we saw in the Taylor series expansion is going to keep going down as we get smaller and smaller spatial derivatives. The goal of a mesh refinement study is to essentially optimize these variables and make sure that we have a suitable mesh for our CFD application. So what is a mesh independent study? So the first thing when we want to talk about a mesh independent study is we're going to define the term grid independence. So you hear this referred to as mesh independence, grid independence, mesh refinement, and all that essentially means is that our solution that we're obtaining from our simulation is invariant as the mesh is refined. In simpler terms, this essentially means that the flow variables that we're interested in looking at stop changing after a certain point of refinement. So how are we going to set this up in Fluent? The process that I like to go through is as follows. The first thing is to set up the geometry, either in SpaceClam or Design Modeler or any other CAD package that you're using. You're going to create an initial mesh and usually start intentionally coarse, but make sure you're capturing those uh, regions of interest or inflation layers like we discussed before to make sure that you don't have an improper mesh. The next thing to do is to determine a relevant parameter to monitor, and this parameter is going to be what we compare during each iteration of our mesh refinement study to essentially make sure that our mesh is being refined correctly. Fourth would be to run the calculation. And then fifth is to refine the mesh and repeat that calculation and essentially go through steps two through four over and over a set amount of times and develop a parametric set of data that we can analyze. And finally, we're going to analyze the results. So once we go through this analysis, our goal is to essentially make sure that we are achieving mesh independence. And once we achieve mesh independence, we can choose a mesh size and continue on to our further analysis, whether that's changing boundary conditions, changing uh, something with the numerics, doing other comparisons. It's essentially where you'd be doing your actual study and collecting actual data from your simulation. So we're going to look at a simple example problem. Uh, this problem you're probably familiar with from your fluid mechanics class or just other uh, engineering work that you've done. And this is the simple problem of 2D laminar flow between two parallel plates. In this case, our working fluid is going to be air. We're going to give an inlet velocity of 0.01 meters per second, and our channel is going to be 0.1 meters tall by 1 meter long. The reason this is a good problem to look at is that we have a very good parameter that we can validate our study to. And this parameter is the uh, fully developed flow profile. So the fully developed flow profile for a laminar flow between parallel plates can be defined by this equation down here, u of y. And what we can do from this is we can determine analytically a maximum flow velocity at the middle point of our channel. And we can also look at the shape of this flow profile. And the shape and the maximum value is what we're going to use as our parameter to validate our mesh independence. So with that being said, let's hop over into Fluent, and I'll show you how this works. So now that we're in Fluent meshing, you can see our geometry here. It's just a simple rectangle or flow channel where we have 0.1 meters in height and then 1 meter long. You can see we have defined an inlet on the left, an outlet on the right, and just uh, wall conditions for the top and bottom. So our mesh to start, we're going to start notably coarse. Our overall mesh size is 0 0.02 meters, or uh, 20 millimeters. And this mesh, just looking at it, may look a little bit coarse. But with a mesh refinement study, you want to make sure you're capturing kind of the whole array. So we're going to start very coarse and then keep reducing down. So now that this mesh is good, we can transfer into Fluent. And I can show you the setup over there. So now that we're in Fluent, you can see our mesh was carried over correctly. 
and what we're going to do is check our boundary conditions real quick so we can see our inlet flow velocity of 0 0.01 which is good and we're going to go ahead and run this equation so now that our simulation is run we can start getting some of the most important data so the two things I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to capture the maximum flow velocity and I'm going to also want to export the profile. So to capture the maximum flow velocity, we can go to the results tab. We can do a volume integral. We can select maximum and then select our field variable for velocity and then select our cell zone, which is our pipe and go ahead and click compute. And what we can do, we now have our maximum flow velocity in the pipe. We can take this, move it into Excel, move it into a different program, and collect it for further analysis. So I have this number plotted in Excel, and we'll take a look at it later. The next thing we're going to want to do is export the velocity profile at the fully developed region. So to do that, I created a line by right-clicking on Surface, going New, and creating a line. This line, which we can display in the window here, is at a point downstream far enough from the inlet that we know the flow is fully developed. And how we're going to export this is by going to File, Export, and then we're going to export a profile. And in the Write a Profile window, we're going to select our line, and we're going to select the value that we want to write. In this case, it's going to be the velocity magnitude. We can go ahead and write that as well and collect those for each case. So once we have our data collected from our initial mesh refinement step, we're now going to go through a series of five steps and keep refining the mesh. There's two ways to do this, and depending on how you want to do it, you can do it a few different ways. The first way, if we hop over here into Workbench, would be to duplicate your Fluent setup a number of times and save the data for each point. In my case, I'm just going to use one setup in, in Workbench and refine the mesh and jump back and forth between Fluent. So now that we're back in meshing, what we're going to do is we're going to take the element size and we're going to decrease it by half. So we'll go to 0 0.01, we'll update the mesh. And now you can see we have another mesh that is a little bit more refined, and now we're up to about a thousand elements. So we'll hop back over into Fluent. We'll update our setup here to make sure we read in the new mesh. And once this is read in, we'll go ahead and rerun the calculation, export our variables like we did before, and collect all the data. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through five steps of that each time dividing the element size by half, collecting the data, and then going back and remeshing. And once you go through all that, you can collect all your data, and we can do an analysis on all that data. So we'll hop back over to PowerPoint, and we'll look at that now. So now that we're back in PowerPoint, you can see that I have all of our data collected. So what we're going to look at here on the leftmost column, we have the mesh size. So we started with a mesh size of 250 elements, and we divided the mesh element size by half each time. And our mesh size is going from 250 to 1,000, 4,000, and increasing subsequently. The next column we have is the wall clock time, so the total amount of time it took to run the simulation. As you can see, we start at about two seconds, so a very quick analysis versus 105 seconds for our, our most dense mesh. The next one is our maximum flow velocity. So the value that we exported from the uh, results tab is tabulated here. The next column is the analytical max velocity. So looking at our developed flow profile for a laminar flow, we were able to get an analytical validation point for the maximum flow velocity which is 0 0.015 meters per second. And then what we do is we take that analytical equation versus the predicted max quality from our simulation, and we can get an error in percent. So what you can see happening here is that as our mesh is refining, our error is decreasing pretty rapidly. And so we can look at some of that in a graphical sense in these two graphs. So on the first graph on the left, I plotted a 
another important variable, which is looking at the error percentage versus wall clock time. So whenever we're doing modeling, you always want to take into account how long is your simulation going to run. And this is a good way to plot out and see for what accuracy you're going to get is how long it's going to run. So what you can see here is as our error is reducing, our simulation time is increasing almost exponentially. The other one we're going to look at here is an error versus mesh size. So a little bit inverted from this previous graph, but you can see as our velocity error is decreasing, our mesh elements are increasing. The next thing we can do is analyze our developed flow profile. So on the left here is the plot of our analytical equation for the fully developed flow profile. And on the right is our actual data from the simulation. So what you can see is that our first data point, so run one, is definitely pretty far off the mark. But as we keep refining the mesh, the flow profile keeps getting closer and closer to the actual analytical equation. So let's discuss a little bit about the mesh refinement study that we did and what our next steps are going to be. So the first thing that we want to know is that we got really great agreement between our analytical equation and our solution simulation. So you can see for our final refined mesh, we're all the way down at about 0.03% error, which is spectacular for a CFD simulation. So some questions we want to ask now that we have collected all the data. The first thing we want to look at is at what point does the value stop changing? So what we can see is if we look at our predicted max velocity, we get this value of 0.0144 for the first one, and then that value is going to increase and then stop increasing and essentially slow down as it starts changing as we refine the mesh. So in my case, I would say that about 16,000 elements, our predicted max velocity stops changing to a significant degree. The next thing we're going to want to ask ourselves is how much error can we tolerate? Depending on the type of modeling that we're doing, if we're doing a quick simulation for an engineering team or if we're doing an academic study or something, it's going to depend on how much error we can tolerate. For most engineering tasks or industrial tasks, some of these values here, so 0.48%, 0.12%, are great agreement and would probably be OK for the task that we're looking at. The next thing we're going to want to look at is how fast does our simulation need to run. So as we discussed before, as we refine the mesh, not only is our simulation going to get more accurate, but the actual simulation time is going to go up a lot. So what we can see here is as we go from 16,000 mesh elements to 64,000 mesh elements, we go from 23 seconds to 105 seconds. In this case, since it's a very small model, 105 seconds is not that much. But as you start getting into much larger 3D models, this can go from days to weeks to months to years even. So we want to make sure that we're not going all the way down the refinement and spending you know, weeks to get data. And then finally, can we trust the results? So with this, we want to look at our data here, make sure our solution is converging here. Also check our fluent setup, make sure our residuals are converging, and just use our general engineering awareness to make sure that our CFT simulation results are believable. So finally, when you take all that stuff into account and you look at the data that we've collected, you're going to want to choose a mesh size to run your study on. So my opinion, looking at this data, looking at the problem we're setting up, and using a little bit of an assumption about the environment that we're working in, I would move forward with this 16,000 mesh step. The reason I would choose that is because we can see that the velocity is converging very well. There's very minimal difference from 4,000, 16,000, to 64,000. The error percentage is incredibly low at 0.12% and is going to be perfectly OK for what we're looking at. And also, the simulation time is reasonable at only 23 seconds. Again, we could choose the 64,000 uh, mesh element mesh. But as we see, we get maybe only a minimal change in the error. And the simulation time would be so much longer that it wouldn't be worth our time. So with that, that concludes our mesh refinement study. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please like the video, share the video, and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.